So I want to discuss, uh, uh, you know, we have this finite size data that we have generated with uh, our Monte Carlo simulations. And hopefully we don't have any errors in the code, so that, you know, the data is really okay. And we have done long simulations, and we have uh, error bars uh, and so on, reflecting the true statistical nature of the data. And now we want to uh, make some uh, statements about the thermodynamic limit. So that's normally what we're doing, at least in, in, in my field. Not always, but most of the time we are interested in uh, going to the thermodynamic limit. So I want to talk about, well, the official title was about finite size scaling for analyzing critical points. But in fact, I will first talk about uh, how to analyze ordered states, extrapolate the order parameter before going to the critical point. And I will give, give some examples of uh, you know, recent projects that I've been involved in. OK, so the outline is, uh, first I want to quickly say something about the properties of the two-dimensional Heisenberg antiferromagnet and uh, discuss what kind of uh, critical points we can get if we modify the Hamiltonian a little bit. Uh, and then uh, really as an example of, of how to analyze data, I want to uh, talk about a case which has some experimental relevance. So there's this uh, material which you can actually tune through a quantum phase transition. It's a quantum magnet. You can describe it by a spin one half model. And uh, uh, I will discuss a model which we have studied uh, in, in relation to that. Uh, OK, and then I I'm going to get to uh, how to analyze critical points. And this is actually based on some recent work. It's a lot of known stuff uh, you know, people have used for a long time, but we have some new twist on, on how to make everything very systematic and, and well-controlled and, and easy. I think that's the key to that things should be relatively easy so that people can actually use it. Uh, and if I have time, and I think I will, I will just say a few words about some pitfalls that are unfortunately quite common when people try to extrapolate order parameters close to critical points and things can go horribly wrong uh, with, with disastrous consequences for everybody. Okay, uh, let, let me say a few words about quantum phase transitions first uh, and compare them to classical phase transitions. So we know we, we have a lot of phase transitions driven by thermal fluctuations, right? So they happen at finite temperature or temperature larger than zero. Uh, but then we also have these phase transitions that occur in the ground state, and those are what we call quantum phase transitions. And they are driven by quantum fluctuations. So there's some parameter g in the Hamiltonian that you change, and at some point there is a really drastic change in the nature of the ground state. So uh, we can draw very similar pictures for both these cases. So we have some order parameter and we have the control parameter, which you know could be temperature or it could be, in the case of a quantum uh, phase transition, it could be or it should be some parameter in the Hamiltonian. Of course, in the thermal case as well, you can also tune the transition by changing some other temperature. But the point is that it's uh, thermal fluctuations which is causing the transition. But here I just put T here to make it clear that we are studying uh, uh, something at finite temperature. OK, so I, if we have a continuous phase transition, then at some point the order parameter, let's say the magnetization or something like that, starts to continuously grow. But there's a singularity there. So there's some power law behavior that starts there. Uh, and if you have a first order transition, there's just a discontinuous jump. And in some cases, the jump is big, and in some cases, it's small. But if there's a discontinuity, we call it a first order transition. So the, in terms of the correlation length, what happens here is that here you have a correlation length which diverges from both sides, if you di uh, define it correctly. Uh, whereas here, the correlation length stays finite across the transition. OK. Uh, and uh, OK, these pictures look the same for uh, classical and classical or thermal transitions and uh, quantum transitions. And in fact, the two are uh, similar in, in uh, many respects, but they are also uh, different in some cases. And uh, 
we talked about the quantum Monte Carlo simulation methods last time, and there you saw that we map, uh, when we do the simulations, we map uh, the quantum system onto some kind of classical statistical mechanics problem which exists in one higher dimension. So it's really the case most of the time that the quantum phase transition can be described as a classical phase transition in D plus one uh, dimensions. But sometimes some other aspects come in uh, as well, which I will not really talk much about today. Uh, OK, so we will discuss continuous quantum phase transitions. And I also want to, when we talk about analyzing critical points, I'm actually going to show the illustration of that uh, for the Ising model. OK. Uh, OK. Uh, let's see now. Uh, I thought I had moved this slide further ahead, but let's see. Should I talk about this one now? Uh, let me check what uh, no, it, it's OK, actually. So. Uh, uh, we do Monte Carlo simulations on finite lattices, right? Uh, and uh, OK, just as a uh, minor remark here, normally we use periodic boundary conditions. So we have the translational uh, invariance. Normally, that helps to get a fast convergence to the thermodynamic limit, although in some cases one can use some other boundary conditions as well. So we have to analyze the size dependence in some way to be able to extract the thermodynamic limit. and. Uh, Sometimes it's clear from the data what happens. Sometimes it's not so clear. You should always try to have some sort of theoretical background or expectations for you know, what kind of approach you, you expect to the thermodynamic limit. Sometimes that's available, and sometimes it's not. But at least if there is something available, you should know about it and use it. So let, let me just quickly show an example for the Ising model. So you all know what the Ising model is, and we can define so this is just the ferromagnet, and we can uh, define the magnetization in that way. So here I show some simulation data as a function of the temperature. So there's no magnetic field here. Uh, and I calculate the order parameters squared, because on a finite lattice, if I do my simulations, eventually the expectation value will be 0 if I don't square it, because uh, there, there is uh, a symmetry in the system, and we don't break it in, in finite lattices. But if you look at the magnetization squared, that's fine. Then we can see for different system sizes. For small sizes, we, we, OK, we see some in rapid increase, but it's not clear it's a phase transition. But as the system size increases, you start to see very clearly that something is really non -sing so something singular is really, really starting to happen there. So then what, what one should do is to look at things as a function of size at fixed temperature. So that's shown here. So if you are in the ordered phase, you see here that things converge very rapidly in the case of the Ising model. In fact, you expect uh, exponentially fast convergence when you have a discrete uh, uh, symmetry that you are breaking. So if we plot it somewhere around here, in this case, it's at the 2.25, so it's just a little bit below TC. Uh, you see that, uh, you know, as a function of size, it pretty much quickly goes to a constant. And note that I have a, uh, this is on, on log scales here. Um, now, if I go above the critical temperature, that's these points here, then you see that I get a power law behavior because it's linear on, on the log log scale. Uh, and if you think what we, do, we are doing here, we are doing the magnetization squared. So if I take this quantity and square it, at least you know that there's, there's some contribution from you know, the same spin squared, so, so that this value is 1 plus something. And that 1 divided by 1 over n, that's what actually gives you this uh, trivial power law here. Actually, it's not just 1. You can think of it as as, as a correlation length squared or something like that, which, uh, which uh, you get there. But at least you can see even at infinite temperature, you will get uh, one uh, as one contribution there. Uh, uh, yeah, so one over n. OK. So, but then uh, what happens exactly at the critical point? So in the case of the Ising model, we know the critical point exactly, so we can really check this 
uh, numerically. And uh, there you also see that you get a power law, you get another straight line, but this is a non-trivial power law, and uh, it depends on the universality class of this phase transition, right? So in, in the case of the Ising model, in two dimensions, the slope here is one quarter. Uh, and that comes from the exact solution of this model. And in other models, other universality classes, there will be something else. Sometimes you know uh, ahead of time what the universality class is going to be, or sometimes you are dealing with a new universality class, and, and your task is to uh, determine that exponent. Okay, so that, that's uh, generally what we do. So in, in, so in general, what we, we may want to do is to study the magnetization curve, or in general, some order parameter curve in a thermodynamic limit. So then it's just a matter of extrapolating to infinite size to get this curve. And here you see it's easy if we are at relatively low temperature and the exp convergence is exponential. But if you see here close to the critical point, it's not so easy because there we are affected by this critical scaling behavior. So eventually, even if I'm really close to TC, eventually if I plot things like this, it, it should converge exponentially fast. But if I'm close to the critical point, first it will uh, you know, decay you know, almost like this critical one, and then it will flatten out. So it's not easy to do the extrapolation close to the critical point. And in other cases, it may not be as easy as here to do the extrapolation either, because the convergence is not always exponential as I will show uh, actually, actually next. So let's first talk about extrapolating long-range orders in different systems and then talk about uh, studying criticality. Okay, so the 2D Heisenberg antiferromagnet, we talked a lot about it uh, last time. We did simulations of it and I showed you the algorithm and so on. Uh, and in this case, I'm considering the square lattice again. Okay, in this case, the order parameter is the sublattice magnetization because it's an antiferromagnet, so we have a phase factor there where we, when we sum up the spins. But again, we should look at m squared uh, because m itself is, is, is vanishing, strictly speaking. And we want to look at it for infinite size, okay? Or as we go to bigger, bigger and bigger size. Right. Uh, okay, so this was for this model done uh, the first time in a reliable way by uh, Peter Young and his postdoc, uh, Josef Reger. And uh, uh, at that time, you know, it's 27 years ago, I guess, uh, the computers were a bit slower than they are today. And in fact, the algorithms were, you know, not at all as efficient as they are today. So in particular, those loop algorithms that I talked to, uh, talked to you about uh, the previous time, they had not been invented yet. So they, but, but nevertheless, they showed that this sublattice magnetization is, uh, has a pretty large value. So the maximum possible value it could have, which co corresponds to the classical value, would be one half. And they got something like 60% of that. Just to brag a little bit here, I want to show uh, our recent result. <clears throat> just to illustrate how, how things uh, progress over time. Uh, so here we have used uh, this projector Monte Carlo algorithm that I talked uh, about uh, up to lattices with uh, 256 squared spins. And uh, again, we, we plot as a function of 1 over L, which these people did as well, but we have much better data. So here I actually plot two things. One is exactly the square of this quantity and the expectation value of that. And you see that it extrapolates nicely to a value, which actually, when you take the square root of it, gives you that. So it's very consistent with that, but the error bar is, what is it, a 2,000 times smaller or something like that. <clears throat> uh, and I also plot another thing. Uh, I plot the correlation function at the longest distance on each lattice size, and that you expect to go to the same value as well. The correlations go to the order parameter squared. So these both agree with each other. And just to illustrate here what, you know, how small the error bars is, here I took, uh, I guess it was the, the, the correlation function data, 
and I subtract the fitted uh, curve. And, and what's the fit, by the way? Well, the fit is a, a, a low order polynomial, I think something like fourth order, because you expect from uh, theory of this kind of symmetry breaking, uh, you can also get it from spin wave theory, you expect that eventually for large size, this should be linear, okay? But if you have really good data as we have here, the error bars are really small, uh, then you can also detect deviations from the line. So you actually need, if you want to fit all the data, you have to use maybe a cubic polynomial. I think that's what we, we had to use here. <clears throat> and this shows the difference between that fitted cubic polynomial and the data. And you see here, you know, how small the deviations are. And you also see that this is consistent with, uh, with the form. There is no sort of systematic deviations from the curve. It, it's basically consistent with random fluctuations. And it's also consistent with the size of the error bars. That, that's also important. So <clears throat> if you remember what an error bar means, normally the error bar means that uh, means one standard deviation of the distribution of the mean, right? And, and what that implies is that the probability should be about 66% or something like that, that the true value is within your error bar, right? So that also means that about one third of your points should be outside this fitted line, you know, outside its error bars. So here, you know, that one is a little bit outside. That's, you know, barely outside. And there's maybe, yeah, so here it's a little bit less than a third. But, you know, there are statistical fluctuations of that, of course, as well, too. So overall, this is very consistent with, uh, with this form. <clears throat> and, and by the way, when people write, uh, results in this way. So the one here means that this is the error bar on the last digit, right? I know some people are confused by this notation. It's just used a lot because it's much, if you know what it means, it's much easier than saying plus minus 0 0.0001, right? Or maybe I forgot the zero now. Uh, anyway, but some people I have realized believe that somehow this is the following digit and that's somehow as accurate it is. But no, that's not, not what it means. It's the statistical error of the last digit before it, right? Anyway, this is a quite precise value, right? Uh, probably more than anybody would ever need. Actually, it's not true. A lot of people want to <coughs> benchmark other methods, and then it's really good to have, uh, you know, very, very precise results. So there's somebody uh, uh, in Japan, Nishino, is, is keeping a list of, of these very uh, uh, accurate numbers for various models. Uh, okay, okay. so that was uh, the nail order. So this has been understood for a long time that this system is, is nail ordered, as it's called. <clears throat> now let's see how we can uh, destroy that nail order. We want to be a little bit destructive here now and get rid of that uh, order. Uh, so there are many ways you can do that, many ways to modify the Heisenberg interaction to get, get rid of the order. Uh, and uh, one way which I eventually want to discuss in the context of an experiment also is by dimerization. So what, what does that, that mean? Well, it means that we have dimers that are coupled to each other. So a dimer here you should think of as a, a pair of spins that is in some sense strongly coupled. Uh, so these red bonds uh, indicate stronger couplings and the blue ones are the in interdimer couplings that are normally, you, you should think of them as weaker. So there are many ways to do this in two dimensions. One way is to actually do a bilayer and uh, couple the layers by this stronger coupling. Uh, this is still a two-dimensional system, uh, but you can also just stay with, within one layer and, and make some pattern of, of these dimers, and there are you know infinite number of ways you can do that, uh, and several of them have been studied. So what happens here is, is that if, uh, if this uh, ratio between the strong and weak coupling is, is very large, then basically you form singlets on, on those uh, dimers. So of course, if you have an isolated dimer, which is the same as saying G goes to infinity, then uh, the ground state of, of this Heisenberg interaction on the dimer is exactly a singlet. 
So for G large, the ground state is essentially a singlet product. <coughs> okay, uh, in the case of, of this system here, if G is one, it's just the case we just discussed, which has nil order. Uh, so on one end you have nil order, on one end you have a, a singlet product, and the singlet product clearly doesn't have any long-range magnetic order. And in between those, there is actually a critical point separating them. So what happens is that this sublattice magnetization vanishes continuously here, uh, and uh, as you know, the, these antiferromagnetic states can be described by spin wave theory, so they have gapless spin wave excitations. <clears throat> so there's no, no gap in the system, but these, on this side here, you have a finite ex excitation gap. Um, so that opens continuously here. Okay, and here I just list, uh, it's not important for what I'm going to talk about today, but uh, this is the finite temperature behaviors of the correlation length in this case. So as you remember from uh, my first lecture, I mentioned the Mermin-Wagner theorem, which actually says that this system in two dimensions can only have order at zero temperature. So all what I talked about here was zero temperature. And if we go to finite temperature in that, in, in that state or whatever we should call it, we have an exponentially divergent correlation length, but there's no finite temperature transition. There's no really phase transition as a function of temperature. There's only an exponentially divergent correlation length. So, but we have a phase transition at zero temperature as a function of this uh, coupling, okay? <clears throat> now, just by the symmetries of, of this system, you have, uh, you know, this, the, the, the spins have three components and the order parameter, you can actually think of the order parameter as, as, as something which has O3 symmetry, then it, it, it becomes, uh, it, it can point in any of those uh, X, Y, or Z spin directions. Um, and since we have done the mapping, or if we do the mapping from the 2D quantum to 3D classical systems, we would then guess that this should be uh, in the universality class of the 3D classical Heisenberg model. And of course, in that case, uh, it's a thermal transition. So this, in this, if you do this model, the temperature is your control parameter. So G here corresponds to changing the temperature in the classical model. Okay, and this has been confirmed by, by a lot of studies, actually, that to quite high precision that you get the same critical exponents. <clears throat> okay, let me not discuss this in detail, but just show a few uh, results uh, for this particular system. Um, so when you do these simulations, you're interested in the ground state. So you really have to make sure that you have low enough temperature to, to, to reach the ground state. And of course, strictly speaking, you, you never reach the ground state. You need an infinitely you know, low temperature. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> you, you can do some experimentation. So what you, you should do uh, is to, to do many simulations as a function of beta, which is the inverse temperature. And you can calculate, for example, you know, the magnetization, sublattice magnetization squared. Uh, and you will see, if you do several simulations, if, if beta is very small, meaning high temperature, uh, then, you know, you get some small values, and then they will increase, and eventually they will flatten out, okay? And that happens when, when P is, you know, less than, than, than the finite size gap, and it turns out in this case, <clears throat> the finite size gap goes like 1 over L. Okay, these are things that, if you don't know them, you have to study a little bit, but uh, these are all well understood. So, so that means, essentially, beta has to be of the order of L, or maybe a little bit, bit lower. So uh, you, you, you should check things like that. <clears throat> and then if you have, you know, done that carefully, you can plot the magnetization as a function of G for, for many system sizes. And then you want to extrapolate, if that's what you're after, the magnetization curve to infinite size. 
Now you immediately see something uh, different here when we compare with the Ising model that we discussed before. There, if we are far inside the ordered phase, the convergence as a function of system size was very fast. It was exponentially fast. In this case, and this is related to the 1 over L behavior we had on the previous slide, in this case, well, it's exactly the same thing. In this case, the convergence is, is, is goes like 1 over L. And again, it has to do with the different symmetry of the order parameter. This is a continuous O3 order parameter. And if you read, uh, you know, uh, books by, you know, Cardi uh, or other books in, in many body theory and, and things like that, you will you will uh, learn, learn such things. Uh, so here you can see things graphed as a function of size. So the black dots here is exactly what we had on the previous slide. And then uh, there's another case, g equals 1.5, so down here. And you see that clearly also goes to some finite value, and you could do the extrapolation, <coughs> which I haven't shown here. Uh, and uh, here I show a value of g very close to the critical point, so then maybe it's not so clear. I could also have shown something in between here, and you would start to see that it's not so easy to say if you are close again to, to the critical region what happens. If you are far inside the disordered phase, then again it, it should go like 1 over L squared. Okay? <clears throat> so, um, right, so in principle from data like that you can get the magnetization curve. Okay? Uh, at the critical point, you expect again the power law behavior as we saw in the Ising model. In this case, if you believe that it's the Heisenberg 3D universality class, then uh, this is what you expect, that it should be almost linear here. This exponent eta is very close to zero for this universality class. And you can kind of see that here. This is actually pretty close to the critical point. <clears throat> so you can see that it's linear, but not quite linear. But to really check that, you have to do you know, very careful analysis, which I will not really do here. I will later talk about some ways to, to extract the exponents and the critical point and so on, which is more, much more sophisticated than just uh, plotting things like that. <clears throat> okay, but there is, interestingly, uh, an experimental realization of this kind of, of phase transition, uh, but not in two dimensions as, I, as far as I know, but there is one in three dimensions, uh, which is also interesting. And I want to discuss that a little bit. Uh, so it's a three-dimensional coupled dimer system, and it's, this is the name of, of that compound. <clears throat> and there are actually many uh, articles about this. This is a fairly recent one by Christian Rueg's group at PSI in, in Switzerland. Uh, so th this material is quite complicated. Uh, I actually can only work with, you know, square and cubic lattices. My uh, ca capability to imagine other kind of lattices is very li limited, so this is very complicated for me. <clears throat> so I, I stole the picture from, from this paper here. So basically, it's uh, the, these uh, copper atoms form the dimers. So these, these have a strong exchange coupling. And then there's, uh, it's not shown really in this figure, but you can look at these papers. There's uh, all kinds of couplings between these dimers. So it's not just uh, you know, nearest neighbor couplings as we had in, in this neat two-dimensional uh, lattice, but it's more complicated. But it, it's dominated by you know, this coupling here, and then there's one other, let's see, okay, I, I was wrong, it does say here. So, so, so the J is here, and then there's a J1, well, I guess that, that must be J1. And uh, I think this must be the next strongest then. Anyway, people have uh, estimated those couplings, so it's pretty. It's believed that they are uh, known pretty pretty accurately. And what the experiments show is that you can actually uh, change the couplings as a function of pressure uh, in some way, which is actually not quite clear. What, what is clear is that if you do neutron scattering measurements, which can actually probe exactly the magnetization square that we have discussed. <clears throat> then you can um, uh, can see that the order vanishes, uh, vanishes at some point. You can also, of course, measure then the ordering temperature, which they have done. 
So you see, uh, this is pressure in kilobar, so this is basically a thousand atmospheres, so it's, but that's considered low pressure, I think, in, in, uh, by people who do such things, so it's, it's not so bad, it's possible to actually do neutron scatter, build a cell and do neutron scattering. So you see here that in um, uh, atmospheric pressure, it's QD means quantum disorder, so that's on, on the side where there's no magnetic order. So apparently what happens when you apply pressure is that somehow, relatively speaking, these inter-dimer couplings grow so that eventually at some point the system can, can order. <clears throat> and they have studied all kinds of aspects of this system, including, uh, you know, the nature of the excitations. There's a, uh, something analogous to a Higgs boson in the system and all kinds of interesting things. Uh, okay, so we decided to study some, you know, toy model for, to, to uh, describe this material. <clears throat> so since there, we expect some kind of universality, uh, we, we can uh, study some simpler lattices, which again are easier to, to deal with. So we studied three different kinds of dimerized lattices. So one, uh, the first two are, are, are somehow corresponding to those uh, single layer uh, cases I showed you in 2D, but now we, we put them in, in 3D. <clears throat> and uh, the last case is the analog of the bilayer that I showed you in 2D. So here it's like a double cube. So just imagine two simple cubic lattices and bring them close to each other uh, and, and put a, a coupling between uh, the nearest neighbor ones and then you have the other couplings in the cube as well. So in these systems, we can also go from a nil to a paramagnetic, quantum paramagnetic phase. And uh, one uh, question we had here was that since, you know, experimentally they measure very nicely the, the, the nil temperature, the ordering temperature, <clears throat> if there is some, something universal about, about that. And you expect, I think, some kind of universality in terms of exponents and so on, but we wanted to see if there's anything more than that. Okay, so what we did was we, we uh, determined the ordering temperature. And then again, I, uh, I haven't really talked about how to determine critical points. I will do that later. So the main thing I want to talk about here is uh, our extrapolations of the sublattice magnetization. <clears throat> and the thing is one has to be very careful to do it accurately. That, that's the point of all this. You saw from, uh, you know, from the previous slides here that, okay, it's pretty clear that you can do a, a nice extrapolation here, but if you go closer to the critical point, it becomes harder and harder, and how can we be sure that we are doing it correctly? That's what I want to uh, talk about, okay? <clears throat> so here is some, yeah, I could have shown this data instead of going back to the previous slide. So here is the actual data for, for um, uh, several values of, of this ratio. So here the critical ratio is around 4.8 or something like that. Uh, and uh, here you see it again as a function of 1 over L. In this case, since uh, it's one higher dimension, the leading behavior as you approach infinite size should actually be L squared. Uh, and you can see that here that there's no uh, no linear term. I think you can even see that uh, visually. <clears throat> and uh, here again, we did some, uh, you know, polynomial fits, and we we extracted uh, 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 the ordered moment, the sublattice magnetization. Uh, and I will tell you about some more accurate calculations and exactly how we do it in in a moment. Uh, and we also extracted the, the nail temperature, and here we use a method, method which is called uh, curve crossing method, and that's what I want to discuss at the end of this lecture. So we don't care so much about this for now, other than uh, the fact that we have determined that as well for several values of this coupling. So this is just one, one example there. Okay. <clears throat> so then, uh, as I mentioned in, in the experiment, uh, the way those couplings depend on the pressure is not really known. Uh, so then it's, it's hard to 
you know, compare with a model. I mean, our model is, our lattice is even different, so it wouldn't make any sense. But even if you did the actual lattice that, you know, corresponds to the, this material, <clears throat> you don't really know how to change the couplings as a function of pressure. So then the question is, can we do something which circumvents that lack of knowledge? And we can do that if we actually plot the nail temperature as a function of the sublattice magnetization. Uh, that doesn't uh, explicitly include the couplings. Of course, the couplings, the coupling dependence is in there in some way, but the way we analyze the data, we don't need to know it. But then one question is, how do we normalize the nail temperature? Because the nail temperature has some, some uh, you know, unit of, of energy and it depends, of course, on, on the couplings that we you know, don't know what they are. <clears throat> so there's some overall energy scale that somehow should be divided out. The sublattice magnetization is somehow easier because that's a number that should be between zero and one half. Right? It, it, there's no, uh, nothing to, to really uh, divide that with to make it easy to deal with. Okay, but, but the nail temperature, so that we had to <clears throat> to, to imagine some scenarios what we can do. So, okay, so we have two couplings, J1 and J2. We could just normalize with one of those couplings and see what happens. Uh, then we get a dimensionless quantity. Uh, or we could imagine that we have some kind of average coupling. So let me draw it in two dimensions because my 3D abilities are a bit limited. Uh, so if we have a, a 2D dimerized lattice like this, Let's say these are, are the strong dimers, and the rest are, are the weak, weak couplings. <clears throat> now, if you think about a given uh, spin, it sees, so this is J1, 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 and this is J2. So it sees three of those couplings and one of those couplings. So if we change the couplings, the average or total coupling that this spin sees is changing as well. So another way to normalize would be to actually normalize by the total, <clears throat> the total coupling, which you can also see as some kind of average coupling if you just divide it by something. So we call it JS. So in this case, it would be 3J1 plus J2. And of course, in, in, in these 3D lattices, it's something else. <clears throat> okay, so we tried that, and also we used an intrinsic energy scale that you can read off of in principal experiments, but also in the simulations, namely the peak value of the magnetic susceptibility. I will show it in a moment. Anyway, so this is what we get. Uh, when we just normalize by, by J1, and by the way, J1 we normally set to 1, and uh, you know, then this J2 coupling is equal to what we called G before. If we just do that, we can see that it looks like uh, like uh, the nail temperature behaves linearly on on uh, the sublattice magnetization. So note again, I, I I do many different couplings, and I calculate the nail temperature and I calculate the magnetization, or I should say, my student uh, Sung Bo Jin did those calculations. <clears throat> and then we just plot one against the other. So the G dependence is somehow hidden in, in this way of doing it. Anyway, so we get some linear dependencies here, that's clear. And that's actually what you expect from mean field theory, that they should be linear. Yeah? So here MS is computed in the limit of Oh, yeah, good point. Yeah, so that's right. So we, we do some calculations again that we actually do it at T equals 1 over L. Uh, and then, you know, since in 3D, if I plot um, uh, T, G, we have a whole ordered phase, right? So this is all ordered. Uh, so if I want the magnetization here, uh, or, or let's say I, I look at it uh, on a line here. If, you, if I plot the magnetization as a function of T, and let's say I do it along that line now, it's, it's something like, like that. <clears throat> so if I 
as a function of system size, I change the temperature. So for increasing system size, I go lower and lower. I will, you know, hit this, oops, this uh, region where it becomes very flat and, the, and it converges quite nicely. <clears throat> so yeah, so, so it's the sublattice magnetization at zero temperature uh, and uh, how the nail temperature beha behaves on that. So you expect, if you do some simple mean field argument, uh, you, you expect that to be linear. Uh, but it's not universal in the sense that they fall on a common curve. But interestingly, if we use these other normalizations, then, you know, almost perfectly, I would say, these points fall on the same curve. But they are, the curves are a little bit differently if, you, if we use, okay, so what is this T star? <clears throat> uh, this is a well-known method by experimentalists to extract an overall energy scale of an antiferromagnet. You measure the susceptibility, and okay, in our case, we calculate it. Sometimes if, if we do simulations, we also say measure, even if experimentalists probably think that this is heresy to say that. But, but okay, we measure the susceptibility, and it has a peak, and that at some temperature, and that temperature is what we call T star, and that's some kind of, reflect some kind of intrinsic energy scale of the system. <clears throat> and here we plot uh, that T star normalized by J1, which is one, uh, for these three different models, and you see that this is not a constant at all. It, it's really varying, and, uh, but if we divide it, this data, uh, this T-nail by, by that, we actually get something which is quite nice data collapse. I would say this collapses a little bit better than that one, but this is also quite good. Okay, uh, and it, it's very linear. So based on that, we say, well, it looks like that if you normalize the nail temperature in an appropriate way, then you get, really get some uh, universal behavior. <clears throat> and the nice thing is that, uh, in principle, at least, this T-star is... Uh, accessible experimentally, so they could do an experiment like that. And in fact, uh, I guess motivated by our proposal, in their you know, later experiments after our paper, they did attempt uh, to do that, but this experimental susceptibility data is not really available uh, you know, in, in, in this uh, complete sense. They have you know, some points, and I think you know, they uh, it, it's not clear, you know, how, how, how good, uh, good it actually is. But anyway, they did it, and what they found looks actually quite a lot like, like our uh, curve. So the T in L divided by that, which they call T max, we call it T star. And then this is the sublattice magnetization in the Bohr magnetons per, per copper ion. Okay, now you cannot still compare these exactly side by side because this is, you know, the actual uh, uh, sublattice magnetization uh, measured in units of Bohr magnetons. Uh, and, uh, okay, what's uncertain there? Well, the G factor uh, of these electrons in this compound, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's known. Maybe it's known, but at least they didn't uh, talk about it. Uh, and then there's this, Okay, so then if you, if you assume that it's two, then you can actually, if, you know, normally the G factor should be very close to what it is for an isolated electron, namely two. Uh, but it could be 2.2 or something like that. But anyway, if you assume that it is two, I could have done it here, but I didn't. Then you should actually divide these numbers by, by two. So what's point 0.4 here should, should map onto point 0.2 here. And then you see that this is a little bit, below, and it's maybe 25% below. So, but considering that there's this uncertainty in, in what T max is, I would say this is quite nice, and actually it even has the same kind of upturn there, although it happens a little bit before here. But hopefully they can do, do more on, on that point. <clears throat> okay, so I just make some comments here that, you know, this is not, doesn't necessarily have much to do with the critical point because it, this extends, you know, very far from the critical point. You see where the magnetization is already pretty big. But this uh, change from linear to nonlinear behavior is quite interesting because the linear behavior you can actually explain from some very simple mean field-like uh, arguments, and it corresponds actually to 
decoupling of quantum and thermal fluctuations. So it just means that that the quantum fluctuations act effectively as a, uh, just a, a normalization of the coupling in the system, which which uh, uh, which is just uh, uh, yeah. And the, and with that, you 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 again get this linear behavior. And then the nonlinear effect would then be that the quantum and thermal fluctuations somehow uh, become more uh, intertwined or whatever we can call it. Anyway, uh, maybe I'm talking too much about physics here. Maybe I should talk just about numeric computations, but I think we have to talk about both. So, uh, And this is just motivating what I'm going to do next. Uh, OK, so <clears throat> I think this was quite encouraging that it worked so well. But now I want to uh, uh, talk about some recent results where we wanted to do more work on this system because this system is actually, you know, it's one of the few examples where you can really tune a phase transition in a very good quantum magnet. So, uh, uh, you know, a, a, uh, an insulator which has really well localized spins and is described by a well-defined Heisenberg model. And you can actually go from the nail state to, to something else. <clears throat> it's it's not not very common that you, you, you there, there are lots of interesting compounds for sure that you can study but to really go through a quantum phase transition is is uh, is uh, not uh, common. Uh, I mean, Bella Lake can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but I think this is maybe the only example, right? Uh, right. Okay. So now we want to. Uh, this is some that was posted quite recently. Uh, talk about logarithmic corrections and study those numerically. So uh, what is a logarithmic correction? Well, this phase transition, the uh, O3 transition, it's uh, part of the ON family of phase transitions. And uh, you know, all, all fa uh, phase transitions, if you think of the universality classes as a function of dimensionality, there's a, an upper critical dimension where above which mean field theory applies. And in this case, that upper critical dimension is four. And in fact, that's exactly what we are doing because we have a 3D system and we do quantum. So that's three plus one equals four. So we are actually at the upper critical dimension. Um, and exactly at the upper critical dimension, what you expect is mean field critical exponents, but there should be logarithmic corrections to essentially everything. Meaning that things behave as power laws times logs, okay? <clears throat> and then uh, experimentally, you know, several of these papers have addressed these issues and, and tried to see if they somehow can detect that it's not really a pure mean field transition, but that there's some logarithmic corrections there. But it's very difficult to, to detect these logs, as you uh, can imagine. And actually, even numerically, there are very few works that have even uh, attempted to do that. So there's some old works on the icing model, but that, that's pretty much it. So we decided to you know, bite the bullet here and, and try to see if we can say something numerically, and uh, if that could somehow help the experimentalists to see if, if there's any chance of seeing it in, in the experiments as well. OK, so th then we do these SSC simulations. Um, and one reason I want to talk about exactly this point is that this is a case where you really have to do everything carefully because you're trying to see something which is very hard to see. And if you do some mistakes in your calculations, it will you know, ruin everything. <clears throat> so now we, we uh, want to study uh, simulations close to the critical point. Uh, but I can still use uh, this. Uh, uh, thing that Sebastiano asked about here, we can still we are still in the ordered phase, so we can still use the temperature, you know, going to zero as a function of L, uh, as long as L is uh, big enough. So here we use t equals one over two times L, uh, and okay, we have a, a cube, and actually uh, there's a, a, a mistake here. Actually, let me correct it because then it looks even more impressive. Um, should be 128, uh, and and I forgot to put in here, but I did now that the system we are actually studying now again is not the experimental 
lattice, although we have actually started to do the experimental lattice now, but we, we, so far we, we first did the double cube. The double cube has more symmetries than the other cases, so it's uh, somehow a little bit more convenient. And we did, uh, uh, okay, n equals two times L cubed spin, so the cubes are up to 40 cubed, and uh, you know, there's uh, two spin units also up to 128,000 spins, and we want to say something about the ground state, right? So it's, it's not easy. And, uh, okay, one reason we can do it is because my collaborators here, uh, Yan Chi Chin and, and uh, Zhang Meng, they have access to the Tian He uh, supercomputer in Beijing, which I think is the world's fastest. So, okay, they don't get the whole supercomputer, right? But they get, you know, many cores, like, thousands of course, you know, running all the time, so it's, it, 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 it was possible. <clears throat> okay, so first we, we determine uh, the critical coupling. And again, I will show you, uh, you know, curve crossing methods to do that in a moment. The critical coupling for the double cube turns out to be 0.4837. I say approximate here, maybe I have some error bar too, but it's pretty much the error is, uh, less than one in that digit. So it's, it's very, it's, it's something, actually it's much, it's like four, eight, three, seven, zero something. Okay, and then again, we compute the sublattice magnetization as a function of one over L squared. And again, the temperature is, is somehow uh, tied to the lattice size. So this is completely systematic and you expect it to go to the correct result. So here I plot it as a function of L squared because we, we do expect that it should be linear then as a function of L squared in, in 3D. And you can see that it seems to be. And now again, I have uh, fitted some polynomials or uh, Yan Chi has fitted some polynomials here for different points. And you see we are getting, you know, pretty close to the critical point. But, uh, you know, these magnetization curves always tend to be uh, pretty steep, close to, so it's, you know, they normally look something like that, if you remember from the actual icing data I had before too. So if we are, you know, even very close, the values can still be <coughs> relatively large. Um, but I think you can already see in this data that, it, uh, you know, this linearity, uh, you know, all these are actually pretty close to the critical point. Uh, if I had shown something further away, you would see a much clearer linearity, but you see that this is more linear than, than this one. So the corrections beyond the leading one, ones are becoming larger as we go closer to the critical point. And, uh, you know, you can really, you know, question us here. Do we really believe that, you know, these points are correctly extrapolated? So I want to show how we are, are trying to make sure that, that that's correct. Um, so we, we do polynomial fits. Uh, but we want to try different orders of the polynomial and uh, use different uh, subsets of the data. So, you know, starting from some uh, smaller size and going up to some, not necessarily even the biggest size, but systematically see how sensitive uh, everything is to, to, to the kind of thing we do. Okay, so when is a fit good, right? So I think you all know what chi-square fitting is, right? So you you have your data and you have your uh, uh, fitted curve and then you sum up, uh, you know, the differences between the two normalized by the, the error bar and, the, and, and that's chi-squared. And then you div divide by the number of degrees of freedom, which is, in this case, the number of sizes we have, the number of data points minus the number of degrees of, uh, the number of parameters of, uh, of the polynomial in this case that we are using. Okay, so for uh, in the limit of a lot of data, if the number of sizes is large, you expect that value chi squared per degree of freedom to be very close to one, right? Uh, and uh, you, you can look up the chi squared distribution and, and its properties, uh, and you can look at the fluctuations of chi squared. So the fluctuation, the standard deviation of chi squared should be one over square root of, sorry, two, square root of two over the number of degrees of freedom. So we characterize a, a fit as good if, if this value is uh, chi squared minus one is less than three of its standard deviations. Okay, that may, you may say that, you know, it should be two or one, but 
uh, you know, when, when it comes very close, it almost uh, doesn't matter anymore. Uh, so so th those would be, be reasonable fits, at least. <clears throat> and then what we do is, okay, so if we have a maximum size L, then we exclude smaller sizes until we can satisfy this criterion. And the point is that the smaller sizes have stronger corrections, so, so they are less uh, well described by whatever fitting function we use. So if we use a low order polynomial and, and, and a, a large, largest size, then we may have to exclude many, many small system sizes. Okay? And then we, we try to see, systematically see what's going on. <clears throat> so here I don't show you what the smallest size included is, but I show you as a function of the largest size included and data for different uh, G values and using different order of the polynomial. Okay, so now you see if we are far away from the critical point, or you know, relatively far, this is still you know not that far away. Um, then these are very stable. You see that this is you know almost a perfect straight line, uh, and these polynomials of order three, four, five, they agree you know perfectly with each other. There are some error bars, of course, when we do the extrapolation, we also do error propagation and we uh, extract the error of, of the extrapolated value. <clears throat> but as we <clears throat> go uh, closer to the critical point, uh, things at least become a little bit worse. There's some uh, you know, weird uh, be behaviors, dependence on the polynomial order there, and, and sometimes the error bars are large. But if we go to big enough system sizes, you can see that and, and big enough polynomial order, you see that it, it actually uh, converges quite nicely. Uh, so, so that's under well, good control. Okay, but this is not still extremely close to the critical point. If we go even closer to the critical point, so these are the three values, the closest to the critical point that we use, <clears throat> then you see that things change a lot. And keep in mind here that all these fits are statistically okay, right? So even, you know, if, if somebody just stopped there and said, oh, look, the, this looks, you know, great, chi-squared is good, we are, or, or everything is hunky-dory, uh, and it even, you know, this, it looks even pretty flat here. But then, uh, you know, it goes up and, you know, then it becomes flat here. Uh, well, you could ask, if we go further, does it jump again? Well, we have, we actually, extrapolate these in two different ways. I didn't want to show too many plots, but one can uh, analyze a slightly different quantity and, and uh, when you, you do something similar, they are different here, but eventually they, they become the same. So we, we think that these are, are really truly saturated here uh, and, and we can, can uh, you know, trust them. And then in the end, looking at, uh, you know, how these things depend on the polynomial order. We concluded that polynomial order four uh, is, is what we want to use, and we go to, of course, then the largest system sizes we can. So we are pretty confident that, that this is all, all okay that we have done. And uh, I, I, I want to stress that if you really want to do accurate work, you, you have to do things like this. And actually, numerics is almost useless if you don't do accurate work, right? Because if you have a, if you have a well-defined model, then the goal should be to find the properties of that model, right? It may be a toy model, as some people may say, uh, but, you know, toy models are, are, are useful reference points for experiments, for, you know, theory, for whatever. So if you have a model and you have a method which can, in principle, you know, do good calculations for the model, if you do things right, you may be able to get results that are really, truly correct and can serve as a reference point. But if it's wrong, it's worthless. Right? That, that, that's like a map which, uh, which is wrong. It leads you in the, the wrong direction. And, and worse for yourself, if it's an important model, <clears throat> you know, next year or next month, somebody else will certainly, you know, do a calculation and show, and show that you are wrong. <laughs> so, so it's... it's uh, it, 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 it pays to, to somehow be accurate. Yeah? Uh, okay, so we would like to go as close to the critical point as we can. So yeah, very good point. You can ask, well, why don't we go further? The reason we don't go further 
is that we simply don't trust our results if we go further. Uh, so this critical point is extracted in a completely different way, in a way which I will discuss soon if I have time. I always seem to take longer time than, I, well, I think I should have time. Uh, it's it's uh, extracted in a completely different way. It's not based on, on this at all. <clears throat> and then the question is uh, only, okay, how close to the critical point can we trust our results? Because things get harder and harder as you go close to the critical point. And, you know, even with TN, TN uh, we can only, uh, you know, do up to 40. Actually, we did up to 48, I guess, yes. I was even wrong on, on the previous slide. We did even, even more uh, spins than I said. <clears throat> so, what is, but what is sufficient, of course, if we really want to study then uh, the critical magnetization, maybe that's what you mean. And, okay, we can see in the next slide, maybe will be the answer to your question. Uh, okay, so the goal was to see if we can see some log corrections in, in this uh, quantity. And there are lots of predictions for log corrections in different universality classes and so on. So what you expect is that the sublattice magnetization, uh, and this is the deviation, the distance from the critical point, it should be a power law times a log, okay? Uh, and uh, you know, this constant here is actually not so important. Asymptotically, it's, it's unimportant. Uh, but this beta, it's mean field, so it's one half. And then, uh, you know, this exponent on the log is also important, and it has been predicted based on, you know, perturbative RG calculations and so on. And it's believed that it should be that. Uh, so if we if we somehow you know just assume that this is a for the form and just uh, you know play with uh, uh, you know some some constants here, we can see what 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 we get. Okay, now we also want to do the fitting. If we neglect the log, just see if we can do a pure square root fit. So that's the green line. So indeed, if you you know if you are close to the critical point, you can, of course, make some, some, uh, some of the fits work, but you see that it starts to deviate here. If we use the log form, it, it works much better. And actually, you can see it down here, it looks like it doesn't work so well, but actually, you know, there are error bars here, too, which are down here of the order of the uh, size of the plot, so this doesn't mean a statistically uh, significant deviation. <clears throat> In fact, I think this is not even our latest graph because we improved the data a little bit after we submitted the paper and, and now it looks a bit better, but I could actually not find the picture last night when I was, you know, making this slide, so I just used the one from, from the archive paper. Uh, but you see the log actually uh, improves things, improves things out, out here quite a lot. So we believe here that you can see logs, but you see also that it's not easy to see the logs. So if you have an experiment and there's some answer, actually to, to do this, it's very important also that GC is uh, determined accurately. Because if you change GC, you know, the, down here this curve changes a lot. So we actually, I, I just showed our GC to three decimal places, but we have, have it actually better than four decimal places. Uh, so... Uh, well, uh, let me not discuss whether this is experimentally observable or anything. We discussed that in the paper. Okay, this was just an illustration of the fact that, okay, if you are careful, you can see even subtle things. Uh, and by the way, we, we, we have even good enough data that we can keep this parameter as a free parameter and see what we get. And actually, we, we get this value to within, I think, 3% or something like that uh, in a very stable way. It's discussed in that paper if you are interested. Okay, so now let me come to uh, how to analyze uh, critical point, fi do, do finite size scaling and extraction of critical points. So we all know that the uh, correlation length diverges at the critical point, and we can have a thermal phase transition where delta is, you know, the temperature difference, for example, or uh, in a quantum phase transition, it's always some uh, distance from a critical coupling. Okay, I, I cannot discuss all the background of finite size scaling theory, but just to present you the form which everybody believes is correct. Uh, so uh, if you have some quantity, it could be, for example, the magnetization or the susceptibility or something like that, which also has a, a, a singular behavior, some power law behavior at the critical point. If you put it on a finite lattice, then you expect 
to have a, a particular form, which is just, not just uh, you know, a very general function of delta and L, but it has a specific form. Namely, there's an overall L dependence where this exponent you know, is, is the same as that one, and this is the correlation length exponent. And there's a scaling function which is regular when delta goes to zero. So if you put, put delta is equal to zero, you're at the critical point, then you just get the power law of the system size. <clears throat> if you go away from delta, then this, uh, from zero, then this is a, a, a function which has a non-singular behavior close to delta equals zero. So it can be Taylor expanded and so on. So this came out, you know, a long time ago from experiments. Initially, people noticed, well, not in the finite size scaling for me, but one can write down similar scalings, of course, in the thermodynamic limit, and that's what people did. And then when people started to do numerical simulations, you know, people started to look at finite size scaling, and initially, you know, this was called a hypothesis because people realized that it worked. Uh, and later it was proven formally by the renormalization group uh, method and so on. So, uh, and this is just, <clears throat> I will, in a moment I will show a little bit more uh, detail of this form, but this is more, the most important part of it. So one way that this can be used is in so-called data collapse. Let me show what that is. So here I show some data again for the Ising model. This is the susceptibility, which is essentially the magnetization fluctuation of the Ising model, and you see as I increase the system size, uh, a sharp peak develops. This is on a log scale, so this peak really grows fast. <clears throat> and now what, what you do is you're saying, well, okay, so let's take this L dependence on the left side. I just multiply everything by L to kappa nu. Then I'm left with a function of, you know, delta L one over nu. So that I can consider as my argument. So if I do that, I take the susceptibility. Uh, in this case, what I should do is, is uh, multiply by L to the minus gamma over nu. So kappa here I use as a generic uh, exponent, and gamma is the exponent corresponding to <clears throat> the susceptibility, which is 7 fourth in the Ising model. And on this side, I plot, OK, I call it delta here. I call it t, unfortunately. And unfortunately, I also said that t is the absolute value. It's just t minus tc, no absolute value. Uh, so you know, it's, this is a function of, of this argument. So, that, that, so then if we plot it like this, what we expect is that all data should collapse onto the same curve. And that curve will then be uh, this scaling function f. So, <clears throat> this should hold only when L is, goes to infinity, right? So, so you expect that there are some corrections to this, and you can clearly see that for small sizes it doesn't work that well, but for the bigger sizes it works really well. And here I know all the exponents and TCs, I can just do it and check. In general, people often use this to extract the critical point and to extract the exponent because you can use these as a kind of fitting parameter or, or, or parameters to be optimized, and you can adjust them until you get the best data collapse. <clears throat> That's what people often do. But uh, I have started a little bit to dislike this, and I think I'm not the only one, because uh, you have to make a lot of choices and uh, so on when you do data collapse. You have to say, okay, what window do I use of points? Do, do I throw away some small sizes? What, what do you do? So it's a little bit hard to be completely systematic and, and unbiased. So that's where the crossing point analysis comes in. And again, it's a well-known method in principle, but we have made some improvements, I think, which makes it even more versatile and easier to use. <clears throat> so our goal here, so this is some manuscript which will be published uh, pretty soon, done with the uh, uh, Hui Xiao, and uh, uh, actually, I. I put her name in the wrong order. Her first name is Hui, and, and Xiao is the last name. And uh, Wen Nang Guo uh, from Beijing. It will be uh, posted soon. <coughs> uh, so our aim was to have somehow a completely systematic and unbiased method to analyze the critical points. OK, I don't know how well we succeeded, but we, I think we succeeded pretty well. 
Okay, so this scaling function is actually a little bit more complicated because, as I mentioned, the one I showed before should be valid only for L goes to infinity because there are what's called irrelevant variables here as well. So, so these are arguments that you see when L goes to infinity, these vanish, and then it just becomes a function of, of that variable. Again, this is something that you learn uh, if you learn the RG. Um, so this is, you know, what we can tune the distance to the critical point. But if our model itself is not at the fixed point of RG, then there are some so-called irrelevant uh, f uh, fields. And, uh, you know, the arguments depending on those will decay away as the system size goes to infinity. So, so this is the actual form. Uh, and we just, for the analysis we are doing, and just to keep things looking neater, I will just keep one of these irrelevant fields, the one which has the smallest exponent. That's the one that is most uh, important. So this is actually uh, what we really expect. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, this function can be Taylor expanded, so we, we do that here. And I just took the leading terms uh, coming from, from these two arguments, but there are, of course, all, all kinds of terms there. Uh, so what one does in a crossing point analysis is to consider two system sizes. You can call them L1 and L2, but there's some specific relation between uh, the lengths. Uh, so the most common, but it's not necessarily the most common, is to take uh, the larger one to be a multiple of the smaller one. So, for example, uh, the, the larger one is two times the, uh, the, the smaller one. Okay, and then what you are doing is uh, often it happens that uh, if you plot, you know, those functions that, that for uh, your, your actual numerical data, of course, uh, as a function of the distance from the critical point, or actually just as a function of your control parameter, and you plot it for those two sizes, they will cross at some point. So you, what we do is study the points where two of those curves cross each other, okay? Uh, and first I will analyze that based on this uh, Taylor expanded form to derive some results, and then we can check it with data. So if you just take that Taylor expanded form and uh, set, uh, you know, A, A1 equals A2, so I just do exactly what I, what I do here, just, uh, you know, do it in this form here, uh, then you will fo find the crossing point I call delta star, you will find delta star has, has this form. So this ratio of the two system sizes, which would normally will be two, uh, is R here. So it appears as a, as a, a factor there. <clears throat> and you see that there are, and okay, there are many other terms after, but these are the dominant terms. But now you see that there's a special case here. If kappa, this exponent that governs the overall L dependence, if that's zero, then this term here vanishes. So if I find a dimensionless quantity, a quantity which doesn't grow or, 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 or shrink as a function of the system size, uh, then uh, uh, this point converges faster. And okay, this is delta star, but we can also write uh, delta star as, uh, as uh, some you know, coupling as a function of size minus the, the true critical coupling. <clears throat> that's what, what, what this is. I, I should call it G star, actually. Uh, so that converges then uh, uh, to zero, meaning this goes to the critical point at, at a pretty fast rate, uh, L to minus one over new minus omega. In the generic case where you have a kappa, that this is the leading term. So you, normally you want to find some dimensionless quantity to work with. Uh, if you know the exponent, you can always just divide, multiply that out as we did in the previous slide, and, and that's then a dimensionless quantity. And actually, if I go back to the data, you can see here, here you don't see a crossing point clearly. I haven't actually looked at it in detail, but, but once I have multiplied out there, you see that the data cross here. So that there's some crossing point there. So, so those would be the, the kind of points we can investigate. 
but but that means you have to know what what that exponent is, uh, the kappa and, and new exponents. Uh, if you don't know what they are, uh, you can use some quantities that are known to have uh, scaling dimensions here. So, for example, the Binder ratio. I will mention it in a moment. So one can always find some quantity which has kappa equals zero. <clears throat> okay, we can also look at you know the value of whatever function we are looking at at the crossing point. In some ca cases, that's interesting too and, and uh, important. So then what one can do, and this is uh, uh, often, often used, uh, is to extract the critical point by, by uh, doing a series of, of crossing points and extrapolating them. Uh, and one can do the similar thing with that. If kappa is zero, it's just, this is just the value at the critical point. So in principle, it looks like one should be able to extract the exponents from that too, because if you fit your data, let me draw a, a graph here. So you have your, your quantity A. Uh, sorry, now you have your, let's say, uh, your crossing point. Let's call it G star, G star of L. Uh, and you can plot it, for example, as a function of 1 over L. It may look something like... Um, Let's say something like, like that. And you have some error bars as well. <clears throat> so in this case here, you expect, uh, by the way, I'm always sticking to this side. I never go to that side. Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, right, so you expect that to, to converge with this power law. So it, so it should go to some constant value, which is the final, you know, G, GC that you're looking for, and this should, should be that form. <clears throat> so it looks like you should be able to get exponents out, out of that as well, and in principle you can, but in practice actually it's much easier to get that value than to get the correct exponent here. Uh, these exponents tend to somehow change as you go to bigger system sizes because we have left out you know, a lot of other corrections too. So what you get is something which effectively accounts for also the higher corrections and then the exponent is not quite right. <clears throat> so this is not so good to, to get the exponents, but it's very good to get the critical point as I will show you. Okay, but then we did something which I think is, is new here, uh, uh, we, namely, also, for the exponent nu, which is the more, more interesting uh, of them, you can actually uh, work directly with the crossing points. Uh, you don't have to um, uh, get it from there. Well, actually, people have done something like that before, too, but we do it slightly differently. So, okay, let's now assume that this is a dimensionless <laughs> quantity, so this kappa is, is uh, zero. And now I tailor expand it to slightly higher order. Uh, okay, now I want to take the slope. So I just take the derivative of this quantity, which eventually I will compute in simulations, but now it's just formal. <clears throat> I take the derivative of that with respect to delta, and by the way, that's the same as taking the derivative with respect to g, my coupling, because, because delta is just g minus gc, right? So if you actually calculate it and take the derivative, then you would do it in uh, when it's uh, available as a function of g. Uh, okay. <clears throat> and then you would also write g there, of course. Okay, so the, this is what you get if you take the derivative. Okay, now take the log of this derivative. Then you see that you get a, and then you get 1 over new log l, and then you get you know, some other uh, power laws of L. So now you see that, in principle, you can extract one of a new from, from, uh, from here, and this is actually what people do a lot. If you have found the critical point, for example, by doing that first, <clears throat> then uh, you calculate the slope of your quantity at the critical point, 
Uh, and sometimes one can actually calculate this derivative directly in the simulation. Uh, so you can do that. Or you can do something I will talk about in a moment. Uh, in any case, you can extract it. And then you plot that log slope as a function of log L. And the slope of that curve, you just have some points, but you can do some curve fitting. The slope should asymptotically, asymptotically be 1 over nu. But you have to go to large L because you have that correction there. And one can do this, but it's, again, you have to think, OK, what size is to include and, and all kinds of things. So we, we wanted to do something uh, a bit simpler. <clears throat> Namely, instead of using the derivative at the critical point, we use the derivative at the crossing points that we derived before. So if I just take my expression here for the derivative and just insert the expression I had derived before for the crossing point, then this is the slope at the crossing point. And now the point is I have two curves, right? Because I have two curves that cross each other. And those two curves, of course, have different slopes because they come from different L. <clears throat> we have L1 and L2. Uh, so then you can use that to your advantage. And what you can do is you can take the difference of the logs of those slopes. And then you see that that's just 1 over nu times log r. And that's just a constant, r equals 2, for example, plus a correction. So now you get something very similar to what you do here. You have 1 over nu on this axis. You have some points. And you are going to fit to uh, a power law correction. <clears throat> that's much easier than analyzing this behavior. That's, that's the point. Uh, and a big advantage, you don't even need to extract the critical point first. It somehow doesn't depend on that. Uh, of course, you get it as well because you, you have the data. But you can still wonder, OK, what's the effect of the fact that GC is not completely uh, you know, well-defined there? <clears throat> it has some error bar, I mean. Uh, so I think this is much easier. So now let's, let's uh, look at some, some, uh, some data. Uh, so this is what we do. We, we do 1 over new star, which eventually goes to 1 over new. Uh, and the quantity that we often use, it's what's called the Binder cumulant. So you calculate the order parameter to the fourth power, divide by the second power squared, and do some subtractions and multiplications by one half. <clears throat> this is a quantity which has a, a neat property. It's, uh, you can show quite easily that it goes to one if you have an ordered phase. So this is uh, the numbers you should put in for the Ising model. If you have some other symmetry, you, can, you should use some other numbers there. Uh, but it's easy to calculate those. Uh, so you see this becomes a step function in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, and it has a, a crossing point. It's a dimensionless quantity because you know, these have the same uh, scaling dimensions. <clears throat> and you can see here that, indeed, you have crossing points. And asymptotically, these crossing points uh, move towards the critical temperature. Yep. So uh, Quite close, because we have already derived here uh, this is how the crossing point moves, yeah. right? Well, it, it depends on the lattice size, but so that's the whole point. That okay, what what many people do actually is they just do the following. They say, okay, we do many systems, and then it looks like they cross each other in one point. Let's just use the two biggest systems, and then we are happy with that. You can do that, but then you still have a small error remaining. So what, what you should do is you should actually do calculations very, very close to the critical point, very close to the crossing point. You can do something like this first to get a rough idea where it is. And then you, you do many points in this region. Uh, and then you do interpolation. So let me show you here. Here I show something you know very close. Uh, this is the theoretical, or actually the correct TC. And here, three different system sizes, the bin accumulant. So you see 16 and 32 cross each other here. And then uh, uh, 32 and 64 
close each, cross each other there, so the crossing point definitely moves. Eventually, it should move, move right there. Both horizontally and vertically, it should go to that point there. <clears throat> so this is the kind of data we do. We do 20 to 30 points, you know, re yeah. Uh, okay, so that's a good question. So here we use uh, this Wolf cluster update that uh, Werner Kraut talked about yesterday. But still, since we want extremely good data now, uh, you know, we did up to hundreds of millions of samples. Yeah. But okay, you don't have to do that. But I want to do something really to show how, how that there's no error left, basically. Uh, the binder cumulant actually has not very high fluctuations because if you analyze the errors correctly, there's some error cancellation because you have similar fluctuations in that one and that one. So, so actually the binder cumulant is, is good in that sense because it has some error cancellation. Okay, so I'm, I'm formally out of time, but I know yesterday somebody went like 15 minutes over, so if I go five minutes over, it should be okay. <coughs> Okay, so what, what we do is we do a lot of points. Uh, we do uh, polynomial, polynomials for interpolating, and when you have the polynomial, you can also take the derivative in the polynomial to get this exponent mu. But you have to be really careful with all the statistical errors. Right? So, okay, you don't see it here, but all the points have some statistical errors. Uh, Okay, we should use bootstrap sampling to compute those. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. If not, I cannot really talk about it in the lecture, but I can tell you, you know, later if you like. Uh, so basically, you, we, we, you can think of it in the following way. You have some data, and now you have error bars on the points, and then you can add some noise to the points, Gaussian noise, which corresponds to the error bars, and just repeat these polynomial fits many, many, many times. And then you get some fluctuations in the, uh, in the crossing points and in the values and in the derivatives and everything. <clears throat> uh, and so you can actually do it with Gaussian noise in some cases. In some other cases, it's better to use what's bootstrap sampling where the noise is coming from the data itself. Uh, okay, one thing which I want to do, almost skip over now, is the fact that you see, for example, here, L equals 32 appears in two crossing points, 1632 and 3264. So all these crossing points are not statistically independent. They are correlated. So you actually should use uh, the covariance matrix when you compute chi-squared. I think that normally people also don't, don't really do, uh, but we have done it now. So here you could represent any quantity that, that you calculate, like the slope or the crossing you know, temperature or or, or whatever, uh, but uh, I don't have the time to explain it in detail, but keep in mind covariance. Okay, so let me show some data and then I'm almost done. <clears throat> so this is again uh, uh, data for the icing model. And now we went up to 128. You can go much larger, but one point here is to see what you can go uh, do even if the system is not so big, if you just do it you know, carefully. So these are those crossing points we have extracted, and this is the uh, you know, value of the bind accumulant at the crossing point. And now you see it's similar to what I drew here. So we, we should fit to a power law correction, but you see that the smallest sizes don't really fit, and you expect that there are some higher order corrections. So we basically, again, we throw out points. Uh, so we always, in this case, we always keep up to the biggest size, but we throw out uh, you know, points until the fit is good. And here we, uh, you know, we are a little bit more conservative. So we say that the fit should be within two error bars. I mean, chi squared should be between, uh, within two error bars of its expected value one. Then we are happy with the fit. So in this case, I threw up everything up until L equals 12. So the actual fit starts somewhere here. Uh, and this could be omega minus one of a new in this case, and in this case, it's just the actual uh, omega. Okay, so this fit gave us this TC. 
So you see, this is good up to almost seven decimal places, and it agrees with the exact value to within that precision. And if we exclude more sizes, their row bar goes up. Uh, but already here, it, it, it's, it's actually fine. Say so again? Uh, 12. Yeah, L minimum is 12. That, that's when we start to satisfy this criterion. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, actually, in the icing model, it's known what this should be. It should be uh, 7 fourths, 1.75. Uh, and actually, if you exclude enough points, that comes out. But even actually when TC is OK, the uh, omega doesn't come out quite correct. And again, it's, you should con it's much harder to get you know, the, the shape of the curve than the extrapolated value. I think that's the point. And that's why we also now want to get new using this kind of method, which I will show you in a moment. But let me just point out one thing here. So here, chi squared is something like 1.6 per degrees of freedom, which is an acceptable value uh, in this case. Uh, if I take the points minus my fit, you can see that this doesn't quite look like random noise. There is some shape to it, but it's barely resolvable within the errors. And that means that there's a little bit of a higher correction here left, which is not apparently affecting the extrapolated value, but it's probably ex affecting the you know, value of, of the exponent uh, in the correction. Uh, but if I exclude more points, then this just starts to look like random noise. So th this is our criterion means that we are you know, barely at the points when uh, you know, the higher order corrections become uh, 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 irrelevant to us. Uh, and it, it, it still works fine at that point. It, th these fits are actually very stable. <clears throat> uh, OK, so let me just for the last thing. Uh, show you what we get for, for the exponent, which often is, is the more sort of interesting thing you're after. If we do this slope analysis, plot as a function of 1 over L, the first thing you can notice that the error bars are much bigger. Here you can actually see them uh, even before doing any subtraction. And that's because the slope is much more noisy than uh, a value. When you do interpolation, you get the values quite well, but you can imagine that the slope is actually much noisier. So the, the, the exponent we cannot get as accurately, but the point is that it, it should be unbiased and you can really see how it flows as a function of size. And the correct value of this exponent is 1, so you see that this is correct, uh, consistent. Here actually we used all the points from L equals 6 uh, and it's still the chi-squared is good and it gives a very good value actually. 1.0001 Zero, 01 with the error bar of 7 uh, in the last point. So as far as we can tell, this is an unbiased method. And one can also, by analyzing other quantities at the crossing points, one can also get other uh, exponents. OK, so I had one more slide on these dangers of extrapolating close to the critical point. But uh, I think maybe we want to have coffee now. So I, I'll just skip that. It's uh, you know, maybe enough for now. Uh, but maybe you have some questions. Maybe some somebody has. For this other critical exponent, what kind of quantity would you look at? Yeah, for example, so if you want to get the exponent eta, which controls the critical correlation functions, then you can look at, at uh, the magnetization squared itself. Uh, you know, the magnetization squared m squared should go like l to Okay, is it plus or minus nu? I forget, eta, I, uh, I forget now. So if you use these crossing points from the bin accumulant and you evaluate m squared at those crossing points, you, you, you can analyze the L dependence at that point and extract uh, the exponent. Again, by, by in a more sophisticated way by, by something that we use here, you can combine the values for the two sizes and take the logs and so on. Yep. Anything else? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That that's the universal value of the bin accumulant, which is actually not known exactly. TC comes out 
exactly from the uh, Onsage solution. <clears throat> but this value here, uh, nobody knows the exact value, but there are people that have extracted it from uh, transfer matrix calculations on you know, relatively large lattices, actually not so large, up to 17 squared. This is a value actually from, uh, from Henk Blöte's paper from 1996, where he did transfer matrix calculations up to L equals 17. So with, with that method, you can get basically the values up to machine precision, and then you can try to extrapolate. I think eventually, you know, with these data, we can beat him a little bit in, in precision. But I've seen token uh, values from different models. One is claimed that the value of this universal attitude depends on the choice of one Oh, yeah, that, that's correct. So it's no longer believed that it's completely universal. I mean, it's universal for a given shape. But if you take a rectangular lattice, it has some other value. If you uh, make the model anisotropic, so that it's effectively not, you know, a square anymore. It, yeah, so it depends on boundary conditions and and can depend on other things. Yeah. I think there was another question at some point. Yeah. yeah. So if you compare the values you get in the end with like the more traditional methods. Right. Yeah, yeah, good point. So the question is what to compare with. So, you know, I haven't actually found a lot of papers where somebody tests methods very thoroughly on the 2D icing model. Uh, for some reason, to me, it seems like a very natural thing to do. But in general, I think people think, well, 2D icing model, why should you study that one? Even people that I told about our work, 2D icing, huh? why? <laughs> but OK, it's a test to test the method, right? Uh, yeah, so you know, honestly, I haven't compared, for example, our value of extracting new. I mean, you could get it from, in principle, from uh, uh, you know, first extracting the critical point and then uh, uh, you know, analyzing the data like that. Uh, but in some sense, I don't even want to do it because I just know that what we are doing is more systematic. So I don't even care, maybe so much about you know what whose value is better in the end because I want something where I can really say that at every step I took into account all sources of statistical fluctuations and I did everything completely correct. If you do something, you know, analyzing this, you have a set of well let me not draw anything because then it takes even longer. You have a set of points, you have to fit some curves. Okay, you decide okay which points do I include, which do I exclude? You know, you can fiddle around it until you get something that you are happy with, but is that, uh, you know, statistically correct? And actually, one big reason we have been doing this now is because we have some very challenging uh, quantum phase transitions where, which I wish I had time to talk about here, but I don't. Well, if I chose another topic for my last lecture, I could, but I wanted to talk about something else there. But anyway. Very challenging quantum phase transitions where people argue, is it a first order transition? Is it a continuous transition? And what is the value of new? And, uh, you know, many people have studied it, including myself. And the value of new seems to be changing over time. And clearly, there was some size dependence. And uh, then we decided to try to do something where, you know, there's no question in the end uh, if what you did was correct. So this is what we, we came up with. Yeah. Right, so topological phase transition, you know, if you do Monte Carlo, there's not a, a, a lot I think you can do because all, no, normally the models people are interested in uh, have sign problems. Uh, but actually, you know, people do a lot with DMRG and things like, uh, like that. And, uh, you know, one of, of the things I, I had wanted to talk about, the last slide actually, maybe I can quickly just, just at least flash it. The thing is people often try to extract order parameters and, okay, spin liquids, I don't know if you consider that, uh, you know, that's a topological phase, right? But I don't know if that's the kind of topological phase you had in mind. But people are interested in spin liquids and then they want to find the boundary between, let's say, an antiferromagnet and the spin liquid and then they do DMRG and they extrapolate the order parameter for the antiferromagnet and so on. But th that's exactly where the danger is. One can easily 
uh, because of these things I talked about, about the sensitivity of the fits close to the critical point. Here is just a, an example of, let's not even care what, what this, this is, but it's a order parameter as a function of 1 over L. If you only have small sizes with this data and fit a polynomial, you would go to a negative value, and then some people say, oh, that means it's zero if it goes to a negative value. I would say, well, if it goes to a negative value, that means something is completely wrong in what you are doing, so you shouldn't even do it. Uh, but anyway, whatever you do, if you have just small uh, sizes, you cannot extrapolate this order parameter, because you see what happens eventually in this case, again, this is a valence bond solid, so eventually it crosses over to an exponential convergence. So it's very hard actually to, to see that you really need to get to the crossover length scale where the behavior changes from near critical to long range order. So that was the last thing I wanted to mention. So I guess I'll post this slide. I, I don't know if I really answered your question, but I took the opportunity to show my last slide. <laughs> you can ask more later. <laughs> Time for coffee, I guess. <laughs>